All right, so this evening, just an overview of facts about furnaces from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. And so I think maybe to start with this evening, let's read those verses together. I have them up on the screen from the NIV, which is the version I think that most of us have. Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, and now I've got in brackets, you may have had to. Now the NIV says you may have had to suffer grief. We will see later tonight, that's not a very helpful translation. They're leaving out a very important phrase, which is, because it is necessary, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come, says Peter, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I remind you, Peter is writing this letter to these Christians scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's Asia Minor. He's writing to them this letter around about 30 years or so after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And he's writing to encourage and strengthen suffering Christians. Because remember, though the persecution at this point was still fairly localized, it wasn't a a legal uh, thing against the Christians yet. They were being misunderstood. They were being tested on all sides in their local cities. From 1 Peter, we can gather that they were being abused by overbearing slave masters in uh, chapter 2 and verse 18. That they were being threatened by unbelieving spouses in chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 that they were being ridiculed by neighbors and acquaintances who were skeptical about their Christianity, chapter 4, verse 14. And Peter speaks in chapter 4, verses 12 to 18, about a very much more violent form of persecution which was on the way, that was still coming, that was looming on the horizon, if you like, for these Christians. It was a very anti-Christian society, remember. Now, can you remember, how does Peter encourage these Christians that are suffering like this? How does he encourage them? Remember, if it was me, I would have said, Ah, oh, sister, shame. I feel so sorry for you. But remember, how does Peter encourage them? He encourages them by letting out a cry of praise. And he expects these people to join him in praising God. Remember, it says... Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, may God be praised by everyone. They are a heartbroken, struggling people. And yet Peter leads them in a song of worship and praise. And this is because Peter understands one very important Christian principle. And that is, remember, when you don't know what to think in your circumstances... Think about what you know to be true about God and about what is true about you in relationship to God. And so Peter reminds these Christians of all of the unchanging things for which they owe worship and praise to God. And I remind you, we looked at that, verses 3 to 5, there are 11 blessings from God for which to praise Him in those verses. We counted our blessings over the last few weeks. Now, he goes on in verse 6 and he says, In this you greatly rejoice. In this. In other words, in all the blessings of salvation found in verses 3 to 5. Remember, new birth, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, an inheritance that is cannot perish, spoil, or fade, that's being reserved in heaven for them, them being kept by God, which we looked at last time, in order to receive the inheritance, and so on. 
He says, in this, these blessings of verses 3 to 5, these Christians can rejoice. And I remind you, the word is agaliaste, which means to leap for joy. And I remind you also that this verse 6, this rejoicing of verse 6, is the key to the whole passage of verses 3 to 9. It's like the hinge that verses 3 to 5 above um, hinge on and verses 6 to 9 below hinge on. They can rejoice, says Peter, because of the blessings of verses 3 to 5. But now tonight we move on to verses 6 to 9 in which we see that they can also rejoice in spite of or in the midst of suffering. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, and again I've bracketed the NIVs you may have had to, though now for a little while, because it is necessary, or if need be, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, because it is necessary, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. This introduces the great paradox of the Christian faith, which is painful joy. That we can be, as 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10 says, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So I want us to look this evening for a few minutes at the paradox of abounding joy and crushing grief. What is a paradox? Well, if you Google it, <clears throat> this is what will come up. I think this is from the Oxford Dictionary. It's a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition, which when investigated actually is found to be true. Or if you like, it's a person or a thing that combines contradictory features or qualities. So let me give you two examples. A paradox would be something like painful joy or joyful grief. Those two things are contradictory. And a paradox is when both are true in the same person or in the same place. Now, having drawn the attention of his readers to this great salvation from the Lord in verses 3 to 5, beginning in verse 6, Peter is now highlighting the fact that this salvation between the, the now of their new birth, their, their being saved, and the receiving of their inheritance later in heaven, that great salvation between the now and the not yet has to be lived out in the here and now in a real world full of trials and afflictions and hardships. That's what Peter's highlighting here. That the Christian life is lived between the now of salvation and the not yet of future glory and our inheritance in heaven. But the now that is in between those two, the present that is in between those two, is a life of real hardship and suffering. And yet Peter says these Christians are constantly rejoicing in the glory of their great salvation. Remember, Agaliaste, the leaping for joy, is in the present continuous tense. They are constantly, continually rejoicing in this. Even though, verse 6, now for a little while, because it is necessary, you have been grieved by various trials or distressed. That's where the paradox comes in. Are they grieving or are they rejoicing? And if they are greatly rejoicing, then how can they be grieving? Are great joy and crushing grief not mutually exclusive? How can those two things be true at the same time? This is the great paradox, the Christian paradox here. That we can rejoice exceedingly, 
in severe suffering. It is above human understanding and logic, this thing, how suffering and rejoicing or joy and grief can actually go together. Now we have spent a lot of time looking at the blessings that we are to rejoice in, in verses 3 to 5. We counted our blessings. But I just want to remind you this evening that the joy is not in the suffering or the trial itself. Okay, it's not in the difficult circumstance itself. We're not masochists. We're not suckers for pain. It is also not a kind of stoicism where, you know, you kind of pretend you don't have pain. You know, the sort of stiff upper lip, grin and bear it kind of approach. That's not what Peter's talking about. It's also not joy in the temporal blessings that this world offers us. Our rejoicing is in God and in His eternal blessings to us. His blessings of salvation, which no one and nothing can take away from us. But now for tonight, let's have a look briefly at this suffering or this crushing grief. The, the, the other contradictory part of the paradox. Now I want us to look at the nature of the grief and the cause of the grief. And as I said earlier, tonight's just going to be an overview of these verses to briefly introduce the, the heading in your outlines, Facts About Furnaces, which we will begin focusing on next time. So first of all, the nature of this crushing grief. Peter says there, you have had to suffer grief. Now that word that is used there doesn't refer to the pain or anguish that you feel in your nerve endings, like ilsa has got a painful cut on her finger, all right? Or like when you slam your finger in the door. You feel real pain, but it's physical pain. It's registered in your brain via the nerve endings in your fingers. This word that is used here for grief or pain or distress is always referring not to bodily pain, but to the distress of the mind and the soul. So the word is lupethentes, and it means to be, to be caused mental pain and anxiety and stress. Deep unhappiness or sadness or sorrow or grief. It's used in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 to speak of the Christians who have lost their loved ones to death. And it is used of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 and 38, where it says, He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. That's that word, lupathentes. So Peter isn't focusing on the external physical afflictions that these Christians may have endured at, at the hands of their enemies. That's not what he's focusing on. He's also not focusing on just the, the difficulties that come with living in a cursed creation, in a, in a fallen world. He's focusing on the internal anguish and distress of the mind and the soul. And one more important thing to note here is that the structure in the grammar of the original text here indicates that they are experiencing this abounding joy at the same time as they experience this grief or this internal distress of mind and soul. The way it's constructed, um, the two things are being experienced concurrently or at the same time. Okay, so that's why we say this is a paradox. How can both be true at the same time in one person's heart? So that's the nature of this crushing grief. It is serious mental pain and anxiety and stress and sorrow and grief. What is the cause of this crushing grief? Well, he says, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, this word, 
translated here as trials. Peirasmos can mean trial, temptation, or test. And it's used in the New Testament either to describe temptation, like you know you have when you are drawn into sin. At other times it refers more specifically to trials, to stressful, pressured situations. So it can be persecution, affliction, physical suffering, anything that grinds or grates against our love of comfort and ease. Or as one commentator put it, any dark clouds that break in on the blue sky of God's providence. Anything that tests or stretches us in some way. The word in its root means to test. So either to test in the form of temptation or to test in the form of trial, in the, to in the form of suffering. And Peter tells us four things about these trials and here are the facts about furnaces which we will be we, we will be looking at in the weeks to come the first thing he tells us is that these trials are temporary and we get that from the little phrase now for a little while now when peter says now for a little while you you have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials this doesn't refer to the fact that each of their trials will only last for a short time. Peter's not, Peter's not uh, guaranteeing here that their trials will only be three weeks long and then it will be over or something like that. Because some of the people he was writing to, remember, were slaves. And their trials would probably endure until the day of their death. Their difficulties would never be removed. So what Peter is pointing to here is the fact that their trials only last for a little while, the little while of life here on earth. He's contrasting here the temporal nature of the trial with the glorious inheritance which he's just been speaking about in verses 4 and 5. That inheritance that is eternal, that is imperishable, that can never perish, spoil or fade. He's saying that no matter how long they may have had have to endure the suffering of their trials here on this earth, <coughs> in comparison with eternity, it's only a little while. Paul makes the same point in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17, remember? <coughs> Our light affliction is but for a moment. Really, Paul? A moment? Yes, in comparison to eternity, in comparison to the glory that far outweighs it all. So the first thing is it's temporary. Secondly, he says, these trials are divinely ordered. And here is where that little phrase that the NIV leaves out is, uh, comes in. There is a little phrase in the Greek, a de deon estin. And it means, if it is necessary, or if need be. And that phrase is important. He says, if it is necessary, you will have to face grief in all kinds of trials. Now, what kind of necessity is this? Who or what is making the grief of these trials necessary? Who determines that trials are necessary? The answer is God. Now, does God send out a telegram or a blank sheet of paper with blank lines on it saying, uh, Tala, would you like to have some trials next week? Tick the box. Or does he, does he say, um, would you like some lighter trials next week, precious? Would you tick the box? Does he say, um, would you like to have some trials for just the following three weeks? Tick the box. No, he doesn't do that. He's not asking our opinion on the matter. You see, Peter is making it clear here that Christian trials happen only if God wills it. If he decides that it's necessary. If he wills to allow it. In fact, in chapter 3 verse 17 he says... It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
And again, he says in chapter 4 and verse 19, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. In other words, Peter is teaching that it is the sovereign will of God that governs or controls all of the trials that happen to us. And therefore, the purpose in them is not ultimately the purpose of evil men or evil people or even the purpose of Satan, though obviously those are real enough. The real purpose is the all-wise purpose or plan of a good and loving God. And so when Peter says in verse 6, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, he means if God thinks it's necessary. And again, this means that Christians will experience the grief of trials only when it is necessary, in the light of God's great and infinitely wise, though often hidden to us, and very good purposes for us, as Romans 8 verse 28 says. That's the second thing. Our trials are temporary, our trials are divinely ordered. Thirdly, our trials are manifold. He says, you... It, you have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now that's the word poikilois. It almost sounds like poikikos. You all know what poikikos is. It's a pot in which you just throw in all kinds of things. And the more you put in, the, the more delicious the end result is. So if you think of poikilois, think of poikikos. The word just means various or all kinds or multiple. In fact, the word literally means multicolored or multifaceted. <laughs> the way a brilliantly cut diamond is multifaceted. And because of its multifacetedness, it dis diffuses and displays um, light in, into all of its brilliant rainbow colors. That's the idea behind this word. And so Peter is referring yet to all the possible kinds of troubles or trials that come upon Christians in general. Whether that be suffering from depression or from some other physical ailment or financial trouble or family problems or work-related battles or persecution for the name of Christ it's trials of all kinds, of all shapes and sizes and colors. But the word poikilois also has a, another nuance to its meaning. It can also include the idea of trials heaped upon trials. One heaped upon another. So many different trials heaped on top of one another. You know, we have the saying, it never rains, but it pours. It's the kind of thing that happened to Job. Remember? He'd, he'd hardly lost his children, and then he lost his crops, and then he lost his camels, and then he lost his donkeys, and I don't know what else he lost, and then he lost his health. I mean, that's poikilois. Manifold trials. Now, John Piper has a lovely phrase. He says, God paints with many colors. Many dark and many bright. But in the end, the canvas of your life will be glorious if you entrust your soul to Him as to a faithful Creator. So trials are temporary. Trials uh, show the purpose of God or are controlled by God. Trials are manifold. And then fourthly, trials have a purpose. Peter says, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The words so that gives us the reason why God would think it necessary that we should be distressed or grieved by these various trials. Now, this purpose of God here with our trials has two focal points. One is immediate, 
and one is ultimate and remote in the future. One points to the now of this life and the other to the then at the second coming of the Lord Jesus. So the purpose is twofold, two-pronged. The immediate purpose of these trials is so that your faith may be put to the test and be validated as real or genuine. Proved to be genuine. And that's why Peter uses the imagery of placing gold into the fire of a furnace or a crucible. There's the furnace, Maria. <laughs> when you have a lump of something that looks like gold, what do you do with it? How will you test to, to know if it is pure gold? How will you purify that gold? Well, you've got to put it into the fire, either into a crucible like you have over there. A crucible is what they call the, the fire-resistant bowl that you put the gold nuggets into, and then you add a whole lot of heat to melt that gold in order to not to destroy the gold, you're not burning the gold up, but to test whether it's real gold and to bring the impurities or the dross to the surface so that you can remove it. You either put it into a crucible and add fire, or you put it into a furnace to fire up that gold, to melt it, to test it, to purify it. And now he says, these trials are calculated by God to be a furnace in which to validate the reality of your faith now. So, Ladies, the thing is that faith is very, very precious to God. But faith that is not tested is absolutely worthless. Let me give you a simple illustration. You may say to me, with all the emphasis in the world tonight, with all the conviction of your soul, I really believe that this parachute will hold me up. Well, that faith in the parachute is worthless until you actually jump out of the aeroplane and trust yourself to the parachute. Then we'll know whether you really trust in the parachute, whether your faith is genuine or not. You can tell me that you believe that chair will hold you up, but until you actually sit on it and trust it to hold you up, your faith is useless. It's untested. It's, it can't be verified. Why does God test our faith in the crucible of fire? Well, not for his information. He is all-knowing. He tests it for our benefit. Because faith ranks at the top of God's system of priorities. Remember Hebrews 11.6? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Remember, we saw last week the way that God preserves us and protects us in order to get our inheritance one day in glory is through our faith, by sustaining and strengthening and purifying our faith. God in his mercy is so committed to making sure that we persevere in faith, that we get to glory one day to receive our inheritance that he will bring upon every one of his true children a crucible of fire in order to firstly authenticate the genuineness of your faith. And then, in the light of that, to confirm it to yourself that your faith is genuine. But also to validate your faith to an onlooking world. Now this is beautiful. This is like Isabel Kunz in the arena, remember? God wants to put us on display to a watching world. It's like he puts you into the furnace, like Daniel's three friends were thrown into that furnace of fire. In order that the world may see, ha, huh, these guys don't burn up. The trials don't harm them. And they see the one like the Son of Man walking in the furnace with us. And so they have to say at the end of this, but gee, was there's no other explanation for this person's character. It must be Jesus. 
That's one of the purposes of our faith being tried. And what is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Remember Paul says in Romans 8, who hopes for what he sees? If you've already got what you hope for, then you don't have... You you don't need hope anymore. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, this determination to believe when the proof is not provided, when the questions are not answered, is central to our relationship with the Lord. God will never do anything to remove the need for faith. In fact, Peter says, he is guiding us into times of trial when he sees it's necessary specifically to cultivate the need for belief and total dependence on him. So what God does is he comes and he knocks away all the supports and the props to our faith, which make it easy for us to trust him so that we will trust him solely on the basis of who we know him to be, our loving, good, kind, all-wise, heavenly Father, and not for anything he does for us. We trust him for who he is, not just for what he can do for us. And so Job says in Job 13 verse 15, Though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. James Dobson says, All Christians will hit some crisis that will demand absolute trust in spite of no evidence and the temptation to feel betrayed by God. And the point is that we need to break through that betrayal barrier and trust God regardless, to have bare or naked faith in God and His word and His promises alone. Uh, Kali, uh, I think quoting Warren Wiersbe once said, we need to trust God in spite of the circumstances and regardless of the consequences. We need to trust God for who he is, not just for what he can do for us. Because that kind of faith is of great value and worth to God because it glorifies him intensely. If we love him for who he is, no matter what he allows in our lives, that shows him to be the greatest treasure in the universe. And this is a very important point to grasp, to prepare us or to for and to carry us through suffering of any kind. When Job suffered, his despair was never in the suffering itself, was it? I mean, you could just go and read Job chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. After all these disasters came on him, he fell to the ground in worship. And said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, may the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And then again in chapter 2, verses 7 to 10, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Job took pottery, scraped himself, sat in the ashes. His wife said to him, why are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. What is Job's response? You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job's despair wasn't in the suffering itself. It was not the trials itself that caused him the most grief or despair. He was willing to accept those if God would just give him a reason why. Job's despair resulted from the confusion about God's purposes. Why did God send or allow the suffering in his life? When he was a blameless man, a man who was always seeking to serve God faithfully. Now, if you read the book of Job, you'll see God never gives him a final reason for his suffering. He never knows the -the behind-the-scenes challenge from Satan that we know about. And so 
Job feels alone. He feels deserted by God. He feels as though God is out of control. He feels as though God has become his enemy. You can go and read about it in Job chapter 23. But the, my point is that this is always the case when we suffer too. It is the confusion about God's purposes that makes suffering so bad and so difficult to bear. You know, the human spirit is capable of bearing a lot of suffering if we have a purpose. And the proof of that is the martyrs. Those who know they're being persecuted for the name of Christ. Those who know that they are being uh, whipped or beaten or, or nailed to a cross in crucifixion or set alight by Nero for his garden parties. If they know that that suffering is persecution, it's for the sake of Christ, Man, these guys in history were able to bear immense persecution and suffering. But when things happen to us when we cannot account for or understand what's going on, when, as James Dobson puts it, God doesn't make sense, then is when our suffering becomes unbearable and we feel betrayed by God as his children. If God is all-powerful and created the whole world with a word, well, then he can do something to prevent the suffering that I'm enduring. But why doesn't he? That's when we feel abandoned by God, when we can feel victimized by God, disappointed with God, as though God is our enemy. And that's just the trap that Satan wants us to fall into. No, says Peter, we must see that trials will only ever be allowed if and when they are necessary and by implication only for as long as God sees it is necessary. Warren Wiersbe says, when God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. He knows how long and he knows how hot. And he will never allow it to go beyond what we are able to bear. There will always be a purpose. Even though we won't see the purpose, usually all the purposes this side of glory, there will always be a purpose. And that's why it's really important for us to make sure we know some of the reasons for suffering, which we can discern from the Bible. And we are going to still over this series, Facts About Furnaces, see at least 10 reasons the Bible gives for suffering. But now, lastly, what is the ultimate purpose of trials? There is an ultimate purpose for our trials, which Peter says is that they may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, that your faith will be vindicated, will be shown to be true and genuine on the last day and will result in praise, glory, and honor. You see, suffering strengthens our faith and purifies our faith so that it will be rewarded with praise, glory, and honor from the Lord Jesus on that day when he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. But then we will say, Lord Jesus, it was all your doing. It was all because of your grace. We don't deserve the praise, honor, and glory. And so we will turn around and we'll take our crowns from our heads, as the book of Revelation pictures it, and we will cast our crowns before him at his feet in worship so that he will receive all the praise, glory, and honor for his glorious work in us. But beyond that, Peter also tells us the ultimate reason for all suffering, which is to know and love Jesus more. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the end result, the purpose of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that is, this is the ultimate reason 
why abundant joy can coexist with crushing grief and pain. Because it drives you deeper into the heart of Jesus and closer to Him. And God's main purpose with our trials is to bring us to the point of total dependence on Him. <coughs> what is the basis of all sin? What's the, the heart of all sin? The bottom line, if you like, <coughs> of all sin. Well, it is pride, isn't it? It's that unilateral declaration of independence. I'll do it my way, thank you, God. Well, what God wants to do through these trials, through the furnace, is to lead us away from that UDI, that unilateral declaration of independence, to total dependence on Him, to knowing Him better. Or in the words of that verse, you should know, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. Well, how will that happen? Well, <laughs> says Paul, through the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings and becoming like Him in His death. That's how. Elizabeth Elliot said, The deepest things I have uh, learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and the hottest fires have come the deepest things I know about God. Hudson Taylor said, It doesn't matter how great the pressure is, and we could maybe change the imagery, how hot the fire is. It only matters where the pressure lies, whether it comes between you and God or whether it presses you closer to his heart. When these excruciating and confusing circumstances are allowed to come our way, we must break through that betrayal barrier that sense of disappointment with God and trust God in spite of the circumstances and regardless of the consequences simply because of who we know him to be. For the Christian, pain is a refining fire that can either make you better if you submit to the trial and learn from it or bitter if you rebel and become angry with God. Which are you tonight? James Dobson says, of one thing you can be sure, Jehovah, King of kings and Lord of lords, is not pacing the corridors of heaven in confusion over the problems in your life. He hung the worlds in, in space and he can handle the problems that weigh you down. And he cares greatly for you. Or in the words of Peter, you're his hand-picked saint, remember? You're chosen by God. You're his elect. And he's moving all of history, including your personal history, to that final climax, the second coming of the Lord Jesus, when all evil and sin and suffering will finally be knocked down and you and God's purposes will finally be vindicated, be shown to be, be gloriously true. Now, someone who really understands these principles and who embodies the great paradox of sorrowful yet always rejoicing in a very powerful way, someone who's like that burning bush of Moses, burning on fire with trials, with, with suffering, but not being consumed, so the people have to say, wow, what is it that keeps her going? Is, I wonder if you can guess, yes, <laughs> has to be Johnny Erickson Tada. She's recently written a new book called Songs of Suffering, in which she writes devotional thoughts about 25 hymns that she turns to when she needs to refocus her heart on the great blessings of salvation. I re remember we said we've got to sometimes take ourselves in hand because our minds will be spinning around and we, we need to really take ourselves in hand and say, Carol, focus on the great truths about God and his salvation. 
Now, sometimes that's very difficult to do when you're really suffering. And I said to you, one of the great ways to restore your focus is to have a playlist of worship songs that focus you on God and the truth about God and, and, and your salvation. Now, that's what this book aims to do. Now, I want to close this evening with a short video, which is a trailer that Crossway, the publisher of the book, made uh, for this uh, book. And I think that when we watch this, you'll see all the principles we've looked at this evening exemplified in this woman's life. So that's what we're going to close with. For those of you who are watching the video, I will put the link for this uh, video in the description box below. this evening and that we've been able to see something of your grand purpose, your trials and tribulations in our lives, those furnaces that you sometimes know are necessary. And thank you also, Lord, again this evening for the witness of Johnny's life. Lord, my prayer is that as we, Lord willing, in the weeks uh, that lie ahead, get to look at these facts about furnaces that you have shown us in your word, that they won't be just exact facts, just a list of the ten reasons why God allows suffering, but Lord Jesus, that they will undergird our faith and strengthen our faith so that our trials will draw us closer to you and not drive us further away. I pray tonight, Lord, for any who are here this evening who have particular trials that they are having to face at the moment, perhaps unspoken trials or needs that they haven't mentioned. Perhaps there's someone here this evening, Lord, who's feeling overwhelmed at the moment who feels as though you are against them, who feels perhaps disappointed with you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will draw very, very near to such a one tonight. And Lord, that you will embrace them with your mercy and your grace and your love. And that they will understand something of the fellowship of sharing in your sufferings that they will also come to know something of the power of your resurrection at work in them. So I pray for each of the ladies here this evening and some of those who are not here. And I pray, Lord, that you will go with us during this short break that we have, that you'll keep us in your mercy and in your love, and that you'll bring us back together again. We ask in Jesus' name.